coming up on Man Enough. Autism in this film is a metaphor for this phenomenon of needing to fit in and realizing, no, it's the wrong question. Yeah. When was the last time I thought my child was not enough? Mm-hmm. What was the last time I thought my wife or my husband was not enough? It was when you try and force that person into a box yeah. that you get problems. I didn't ever get up in the morning and think, how am I going to fuck up my kids, right? <laughs> or let me see, how can I end this marriage now? <laughs> oh, no, I, I thought it was a good idea, whatever I was mm. railing against. <laughs> Being man enough, what does that mean? It's really manly to mess up, admit you're wrong, and then grow. I couldn't accept that I was evil, so maybe I'm broken, but those broken things could be corrected. Intimacy between a father and a son is me just wanting to like put my head in your lap. I love you, son. You haven't called me a benevolent sexist, but my experience is women are better. Even if it's a positive, it's still not equality. I don't blame men for that. I just blame the system. This is Man Enough. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. I'm Jamie Heath. I'm Liz Plank. And where's Justin? He is doing three million things. I yeah. feel like um, it would be hard to name one thing, but he's, he's probably like balancing. He is balancing a, a lot, lot right now. Yeah. He wants to be here with us, but he's um, in the middle of um, post for a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've got each other. We do. We are a show that's obviously called Man Enough. Why is it called Man Enough? Not because we want to be um, the stereotypical version of Man Enough, but how do we redefine it, undefine it, deal with the masculinity in the healthy forms? How can we just highlight things that we can be better as a human existence and human spirit? So we have real conversations with people. What are their struggles? What are they doing well? What can we learn from? Mm -hmm. How can we hold ourselves more accountable? What have we learned along the way that uh, through marriage, through life, through children, through being maybe I'm not our best self. Um, What have we learned from your voice? All that. So we do this all the time. And those who like listening to us, tune in. And those who don't, um, listen to Tony Goldwyn. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. Here we go. Oh, did I let you get out of the bag? (laughs) Or those who don't, actually, actually, it's because you are here. Let's let's introduce who we got. Who we got? We got two very, very special guests. Uh, I'm super excited to to talk to. We have Tony Goldwyn, who is honestly one of the very, just very special people in my heart. Like, you have always... um, taken a stance on so many issues, uh, in addition to being a very talented actor that could be doing a million other things um, than speaking out on issues uh, w- like women's issues and reproductive rights. Um, you agreed to do like a stupid video, little video with me when I was right. at Fox <laughs> three days before the 2016 election and just read a script, um, you know, without you were like, you just trusted me fully. You're like, yeah, I'll, I'll read whatever and delivered an incredible uh, performance of, of like a feminist male president that would call out sexism in the coolest way possible. So um, I've been really a a fan of yours for so long. Um, But if you don't know Tony Goldwyn, if you live under a rock, um, he's an actor, producer, director, a political activist. He recently finished directing an incredible film you all have to go see. Um, It's called Ezra. It stars um, Bobby Cannavale, Rose Byrne, and Robert De Niro, and like 18 million other cool people like yep. Rain Wilson. I'm like 10 out of 10. Whoopee. The cast is incredible. And then you're with your friend because you guys are like besties, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Tony Spiridakis, who is an award-winning director, writer, actor, and producer. He wrote Ezra um, and it draws on his own experience of raising his son on the autism spectrum. You are also involved in so many different amazing causes. You have a workshop for emerging filmmakers. You've been a strong advocate for autism awareness. And we're really, really excited to have you here to have a conversation about all of those things, fatherhood, masculinity, um, disability representation, um, Mm -hmm. and so many more. So, yeah, thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So great. And and let me just also say this before we jump in. We've partnered with Closer Media Wayfair as part of the studio that made the movie. So thank you for that. And it has been a joy and pleasure. We've made a lot of movies here at Wayfair. And we've worked with some good people. But then there are some great people some collaborative ones, ones that are humble through the process, that are kind to everyone. Tony, when you walked in, both of you, but specifically I saw you walked in, you asked everybody their name, introduced yourself. That's not something that you see oftentimes. People come in, they feel entitled. 
this is how we saw the whole project and the whole process work. So I was honored to know that we were doing this film with you, that you were indeed, before your work, a good human. Oh, thanks. Um, so that was a pleasure to be a part of. And Tony, you've been, I mean, we've been talking to you and you're working on other projects. Yeah, I'm not that well. guy. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. not it's okay. Um, so that's part of the reason why we wanted you on because Ezra is important, but really what's more important is the people behind Ezra and why that was important and um, what's behind your hearts. And we have some themes that um, I think we all share. Children, marriage, you have a child who's autistic. I have a brother who's Down syndrome, um, different, but dealing with a special needs child. Um, I have a mother who's bipolar. You've talked about that. Your experience, how close you guys are, you know, Liz is championing of all these things. So there's a lot of themes I think that we can get into that speak to the human spirit, but also talk about Ezra along the way. Is that all right? Right. So what are the first questions that we asked? When is the last time that you didn't feel enough? Um, well, I woke up about seven. <laughs> <laughs> and that's usually what the first thing I think is, um, how uh, I could be enough. And so I think there's, you know, you're asking a person who kind of has a drive, a certain drive to, and I get this, I think I've gotten this as I've gotten older, but like to leave the world in a better place. So I kind of have like, I have to be enough to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that happens to me often. It really does. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. How about you? Um, yeah, it's a daily question that comes up. It's part of a, a self-discipline, I think, to um, counteract that impulse. Not only are we all enough, we're all that it's all right here. It's all, it's all there all the time. Mm -hmm. There's no, uh, it's a false lens to look at. Uh, it's a false question, I guess is mm -hmm. the way. Mm. So it's, um, you know, our egos are always going to be attacking us in that way. So I find it's like a wrong feedback loop. So when that comes up for me, I, I sort of by habit shift the lens by taking action to do almost anything. And then you, and then you have the sensation of like, oh, that was bullshit. Like, what was mm. I even talking about? Is the is solipsistic the right word? You know, it's something, it's an inward gaze of, that's sort of, sort of a self cannibalizing thought loop. Mm -hmm. And all you need to do is turn it outside, outside oneself, either be, do something creative or have a human interaction or do something for someone else or do anything. And suddenly the, 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 that, that false circuit is broken, I find. Mm -hmm. so, but I love that you said uh, false question because yeah. it really kind of is yeah. designed mm -hmm. to be that, right? It's, um, Unless you need to write dialogue you... about really fucked up people <laughs> and then you want to have that question. <laughs> And you want to go into that place and All it's right. sort of like you use it for, right. you know, th yeah. there's like an expl. I mean, I'm not being funny about it mm. just to be, I, it's like, I need it to have, yeah. I have to go into that someplace in that place because Tony's answer is so beautiful. It, it is. is really a false question. It, it really is something mm -hmm. that I think as a person, personally, I aspire all the time to have that knowledge and wisdom and then there are other times that i find i really need to call on it yeah and and in some ways when especially i guess the last three things i've been writing i feel like i needed that as a point counterpoint in a way if you mm -hmm. know what i mean well it's so i love what you just said because I, I think that question of you know not feeling enough is probably what prompts most people to like what prompts most of us to do things that make us unhappy or that are problematic or right like most people who do bad things, right. right? It's coming usually from a place of not feeling enough. And then it, how does it come out? It depends on what your, you know, pick your poison or, you know. See, and then I think of it as like, I think of it as what I can do to make the world a better place. And I right. use that. I'm not enough to make sure that I get something done today that's meaningful. Right. So that I do feel like enough. Like mm -hmm. there's also that. Yeah. Right. It's yeah, not it be a just, motivator. but there's also nothing wrong with, yeah, with exactly. I, I think it's often confused. Like there's a very healthy impulse in us to want to achieve more, to do more, to be better, to be more evolved, to be, uh, to accomplish more, to put more out into the world, to, you know, to, to, um, to do more, but that doesn't mean that what you're doing is not enough. <laughs> it's yeah. weird. It's yeah. like, um, I confronted all the, I different every time I, every time I work, definitely <laughs> as an actor or director, particularly as an actor, because you're, um, you know, there, you're always in this sort of feedback loop with either your audience or a camera or a director or the or the media or whatever it is. Uh. You're constantly getting 
yourself bounced back and it's easy to feel um and then also this you know the comparison thing you know the comparison is the thief of joy kind of experience when you're it, when you're constantly out there and it's easy to get detoured mm. but the impulse to um to want to grow is super healthy and yeah. amazing and necessary yeah so um yeah i found like it is an interesting motivator it's almost like you misunderstand the question that you're asking yourself. Right, <laughs> yeah, right. You right. know, it's like you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, yeah. I didn't work hard enough, or I'm not, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not good enough. I didn't, I sh should have done, the, you know, yeah. as, as opposed to going, okay, so I want to, I don't know, I feel like working hard. I, I, you yes. know what I mean? There's like a positive yeah. spin. And just, right. that's why I said when I, you just start doing something and all of a sudden it's a lens shift. So. Yeah, thank and you. I, I do my best work when I don't feel like crap too, by the way, right? For like sure. I think oh God, when yeah. you're in that loop, you think you need it in order to, like if I don't feel not enough, then I won't, you know, get off my ass and work and draw, and have the drive and ambition. But it's the opposite. Like you mm, do so much yeah. better work when you're not coming from a place of self-loathing. Well, let's ask you this. Um, so you made this movie, Ezra. What was the personal reason why this story was important for you to write, for you to tell? Well, it goes right to the question you just asked about, how, you know, do you feel like you're enough? It's about being a father. And for me, the journey started where I got, got, I got sort of outmatched by something that happened that I didn't expect to have happen, which was that my son was diagnosed um, as autistic. And my world changed, and, and, and I was um, trying to joke about it and trying to, you know— I remember telling the doctor, like, you know, like, so I, I'm working, I got money, like, how long do we need to fix this? And the yeah. doctor just looks at me like, oh, this guy's just terrible. <laughs> like, you know, like, he's going to need a long time in therapy <laughs> to get through this, to figure out that this is what your son is. It's not that he has a cold or COVID or he's autistic. It's who he is. And I was like, well, let's fix him. And so talk about starting with a question like, you know, do you feel like you're enough? Like now I'm like, I'm going to be super dad. I'm going to make this all right. I'm going to take this on. Let's mm. go. And everybody was like, dude, you just got to slow down, figure it out, learn what autism is, you know, and get to know who your son is. And that was the beginning of this wild ride of denial, anger, depression, uh, you know, blame, um, uh, so many different things, and I, 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 uh, I held on for dear life, and you know things happened, and some things I wanted to have happen, and some things I did not want to have happen, and I was more than not wrong in most of my decisions, but I'm a strong person, and I went after those wrong decisions with a fervor and tried <laughs> to win everybody over, and then went, oh my God, that was wrong, and so. This journey to me seemed like I had to start chronicling some of the things because the beautiful thing that saved me in being so wrong was my son and how beautiful he was and how mm -hmm. it, not just beautiful like in his heart, but he was like literally beautiful. Like, like if he cried and screamed, which he did all the time at the supermarket, I'd be like, oh, fuck, they're going to think I kidnapped this kid. <laughs> he looks like the Gerber baby. He's like, <laughs> he doesn't look like my child at all. And I'd be like, come on, pipe down, you know? And like, <laughs> I didn't mean any bite me. And I'd be like, you know, it's like all this stuff. And I remember thinking he had this way of, um, as he grew out of screaming and biting and, doing so many inappropriate things, getting thrown out of school after school. He, st I started to try to figure out his outbursts and find the logic in them somehow because they were so like nobody could figure it out. He was just like pulled out of class. And I'd be like, no, but what did he say? And um, I would figure out there was this sort of loving comedy comedian inside of him. And he was funny and he'd make me laugh in spite of all my fear and anger and denial. And that was, to me, I just started writing stuff down. Mm. And that was the beginning of it. And then I would, you know, what happens is you, you call, you know, w this happened when we were living in the same Connecticut town. And I'd like, like call him up and go, he peed on a tree at recess. <laughs> and he'd be like, kind of like, ha ha, you know, like, that's not good. Mm -hmm. And I think it was like the, you know, but it's great, right? Because, mm -hmm. and so I was always trying to figure stuff out. And after telling and telling people and 
I realized I was like desperate to make them laugh somehow. And so I thought, I, I got to write this down. And I started writing it down and piecing stuff together. And it kept growing. And I'd start to show Tony. And, you know, before I knew it, I had a draft. It was more like Meatballs than it was uh, Ezra because I thought it was a wacky comedy <laughs> about autism. Mm. And, um, and then as my son grew, the script became like a living document of his growth. And so what happens is your, your children who are autistic and parents know this, they go through different, um, they change and they change in either better ways or not better ways in terms of being harder to deal with, you know, more inappropriate or less inappropriate and that kind of thing. And so, you know, I just stayed with it and kept writing it and found that there was a movie, you know, about eight years later, like I had done a TEDx talk and um, uh, that my other stepdaughter made me do because she loved hearing all these funny stories. And so I started to think from that TEDx talk, I started to shape another version of the script. Mm. And then I'd do a reading and I'd show it to Tony. And I developed it with a writer's group. And I did everything I could to not stop telling my story about this incredibly difficult thing in my life, which... Mm. And I didn't stop until I realized it was a gift. And then when I realized it was a gift, he saw that draft and was like, we got to do this. It had been a while since I directed a feature because I was on the TV show on Scandal. So I couldn't direct a movie. It had been, so it had been over 10 years or, or about 10 years and um, since my last feature. And Tony sent me this draft. I had read multiple drafts of this over the years, but I hadn't read one in a while. And he said, I've reworked it. And, and would you take a look? And I read it. And I was so moved by it and uh, thought Tony had so solved some of the structural things that hadn't quite worked in before. And I just, I just felt like we have to do this. But I, I, the root of it for me, I guess, was our friendship. I thought, what a beautiful thing to do for our friendship. Like, what a cool thing to tell this story about this sort of collective family that we have. Because uh, we've known each other for so, we've known each other for f over 40 years, 43 years, I think. So, um, and I've known Dimitri since he was a baby and went through, as Tony mentioned, all that that he was describing. How uh, old is Dimitri? Dimitri's 24? Just turned 25, 25, 25 on the right. 18th, just May 18th, yeah, yeah. 25. So, so it was, it was, a more, I mean, I've made some films that were very personal to me, but this was the most personal. And, um. It was just a joy. I, and so I said to Tony, I said, we need to do this together. And I did say to myself at that moment, because it's it's also such a challenge to get an, a movie off the ground. It, it seems so improbable until you do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I was like, and, and I, I'd been through it before, so I knew what an Everest it is to do, but I thought, yeah, but I'm doing it for Tony. What a great thing to do. Like, how 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 great. So we just got to work on it. Yeah. Wow. That's so beautiful. I agree. Wow. I'm um, curious about another area. Um, the shame that we feel as men um, can feel for appearing to be broken, not having it all together. One of the things you talk about is bipolar. Can you share a little bit about just that journey and what your relationship with it is, what it's meant, um, how you've navigated life? Is there what can be we can learn from um, embracing ourselves and not feeling less than? You know, in every family, there's different kinds of um, emotional disabilities. I'll call them, but you know, they're also abilities. I mean, from the greatest minds we've had minds of m madness really or great depression and these people have become our poets our painters our musicians uh, so y y you just have to look at it and realize you know i know this is a stupid thing to say but it's like okay there's this depression and it's like this gift too and there's some way how are you going to think i remember teaching uh, class and so many people were uh, uh, really dealing with depression. And I just finally was like, you know what I did last night? I just made a bath full of my sadness and I soaked in it. And they were like looking at me like, what's he talking about? <laughs> and I was like, just think about that. Like, just like stop resisting it and just sort of soak in that. 
and and then come out of that and just figure out that's who you are. That's now your skin, and now your skin's tingling, and you just get up, and you put your clothes on, and you go de deal with the day. I mean, I felt like in my family, I had a, uh, you know, there's a, there's. <laughs> There's an instability of emotional, like there was like, it, whether it was bipolar technically or not, you know, there was like a, a person <clears throat> who was raising me who I, I didn't know where, where what, what side of the fence we were on at any given time. It was difficult. And so, um, you know, and, and, and it, it brought out things in me that I was exhibiting similar, you know, behaviors. And so I think that, um, and then my son had his own, not Dimitri, but my other son had his own real demons that were, I was like, oh my God, what's going to happen now? Because this is going to take, the dark side's going to take him. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and I'd be like, oh my God, Dimitri's autistic, but he's autistic and he tells jokes and you know, <laughs> he's on trees. This other guy's thinking things that are negative ideation that is just terrifying, right? So... I was like caught in a vice of that whole thing. And then there was myself with all of my explosiveness and the things that I blew up. And I started to just sort of look at all of it and try to draw a bath and soak in it and, and let it be, let me be who I was. But I also had to share and just stay on top of it and go to therapy and get help and ask for help. I mean, if you're dealing with depression and you're dealing with bi any kind of bipolar behavior, get help. There, there are ways to deal with these things. We all have it in our lives in certain certain ways to different degrees. And, you know, some people do have core pains that are really important to deal with and mm -hmm. should be mined out and talked about because it will help alleviate the pressures that come from living with a core pain. Mm -hmm. So people are, you know, I, I have so much more awareness because my son was autistic. Right. I have so much more awareness. Like well, now I'll think yeah. so-and-so does this and this, and then I'll say, but let's think about that. Why is that person doing that? You know, I think maybe they're on mm -hmm. the spectrum or, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like mm -hmm. giving ourselves this, yeah. you know, place yeah. that we can think right. through. Well, it's really common for um, uh, kids with disabilities to be diagnosed and then their parents learn that they have it too, right? right. So they get diagnosed after. Mm -hmm. um, it happens a lot with uh, dyslexia and, and sort of neurodivergence, ADHD. ADHD it happened to me, with sure. me and my mom. Well, yeah, I, my I got brother diagnosed. with his son too. So. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you get diagnosed and then you tell your parent and they're like, no, that's normal. No, no, no. <laughs> and no, that's just how reading is. And you're like, no, it's it's not. Um, it doesn't have to be this hard. Um, and then they will often end up being diagnosed afterwards. So, did, yeah, did you, did um, your son's diagnosis sort of give you, I know it's not the, you know, it, it, it's, it's not the same, but did it give you a portal into understanding yourself better too and sort of asking different U questions? Ultimately it did. But the first thing that happened is that person I described who's like my love my mother my mother is so wonderful but she's really <laughs> tough and she's still with us and god love her but her reaction was oh stop it right, right. yes 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 yes, yes. Yo, it like, yes. It's like it's a diagnosis you know yes. she's an intelligent woman yeah. we're not talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's a college educated teacher mm -hmm. she's brilliant Stop it. What yeah, do you mean yeah, stop yeah. it? I didn't do anything. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's say, yeah. She goes, nobody has to know that. That's ridiculous. That's like, oh my God, don't you see what you're doing? And I'm like, wow. somebody wow. should have told you what yes. you, somebody should have diagnosed you. And yes. I might add an easier time. I wouldn't have been a bedwetter. You right. know what I mean? Like, hmm. it's like, it's all, it's all wrapped up, right? It's mm -hmm. all, and, and it really is true that, 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 that person did that. So my first fight of finding out anything about me with my son getting diagnosed was like who my mother Dang. was. So to me, it's all interconnected. I... You know, so yeah, tell me my son's this. And then my mother's in my ear going, your wife is she's evil. She wants, to, she wants to name it. And <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. Is she really evil? Mm. And then, you know, there were days where I'd be like, yeah, she is. She's evil. <laughs> you know, and then you get confused and you get lost and then you start thinking, who the hell are, who the hell are you? Mm. And how did you get here? And that, that's the journey to me that my son triggered by getting the diagnosis. You know, he, I got the diagnosis like because he cleared out a birthday party because he didn't get a chair in, in, in musical chairs. And the chairs went like through windows and out the door. <laughs> it was like, please come get your son. And it was a really good friend of mine who then pulled me aside and said, you need to get him 
uh, you need to get them diagnosed because that's what I just saw wasn't mm. neurotypical. Right. And not to be Pollyannish about it, but one pattern that reveals itself is when you embrace the thing that you're most terrified yeah. of. Like Tony's worst fear was all this was happening and that it was real. Yeah. And the turning point from my perspective w with you, even in your relationship with your mom, but but like, but certainly with, with autism, when from the moment, which was many years ago now, that you embraced the re reality, mm -hmm. it suddenly transformed into this extraordinary gift that has found expression in this piece of creative work you've just done or we've just done together, but in your relationship with Dimitri and his gifts and what he, you know, I mean, he's what you've enabled him to do. And, and I don't just, it's like, mm -hmm. these, it's such a common thing, you know, like when we, it's yeah. like, um, you know, it always it caused me so much anguish to see parents, for example, rejecting their children because they're gay, right? Mm. And when I've seen, and I've seen the years lost of friends of mine whose parents could never come to terms with their homosexuality. And, and yet I also then see the parents that have turned the corner who were of that generation who couldn't. And then when they did, the insane dividends that came from embracing reality mm -hmm. of who their child is and the love that came from that. And, and sometimes the, the intensity of the rejection boomerang back to the intensity of the love. I mean, you know, like mm, uh, wow. I've seen that happen too. So it's all, it's all just like, there, there's no right or wrong, right? You know, it's just, mm. we're all just people trying to figure it out. Mm. But it is an interesting phenomenon when you embrace that thing, when you embrace reality. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's no it right pays, or wrong. pays but, dividends, man. But there's a, <laughs> there's a more productive way than another yeah, way. Yeah, there's a more to, loving way. More loving ways to get through things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, very, very sad. And, and that that's what makes you closer. Right. Uh, I, I mean, again, I, I, I'm not sure. Maybe you'll get there with your, your mom, too. Or, or, oh, he's have, there. We got. OK, yeah, well, there you yeah, go. Yeah, right. Yeah. We got, we definitely she's. Yeah. Yeah. And then that bring you also closer, I'm sure, to even, you know, if for her to reveal maybe what made her so nervous about this diagnosis. Yeah, she she got. Uh, his art. She was an artist, yeah. so they can, they. To me, she's a painter they, and a yeah. really yeah. brilliant. Yeah, painter. and yeah. so she is too. Okay. And so when she saw his drawings, and that didn't happen till he was like fourteen. Actually, we didn't really know he was doing doodling on his the iPad we gave him, and then <laughs> my other son was like, "Have you looked at his iPad, stupid?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "All right, all right." And I looked, and there were all these amazing drawings. And I shared them with my mom, and that became, oh my God, that's what he, you know, mm -hmm. he's like me. It's like, yeah, mom, right. you're autistic. Right. <laughs> it's like, you got it. And so there was like a, a really, so there, there was that. There was that, whatever that superpower was that they both shared, mm -hmm. it, it brought her out in a way that was, um, Still can't talk about. It. She still doesn't talk about it that way. But it, but he's he he. She just found his heart. Yeah. And and that made her uh, because she went through terrible terrible things in sure. her own life. See, it's always sure. yes. Think about yes. what the other person has gone through. They're not just who they are because right. they they didn't get up and go. I'm going to be a terrible person. Things happen, mm -hmm. and something made them that way. And mm -hmm. and that would be yeah. a good thing for us to consider. And, and that often it's a, it's a projection, right? So because I went through this and it was so hard for me, I don't want it to be hard for you. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, I mean, if we take the example of, of the kid who's gay, right? It's like you're not helping them by, you know, suppressing it. But it feels that way maybe if you're still in the fear and you're not sharing and connecting and mm -hmm. really revealing what is so difficult, you know, mm -hmm. with, with a child being autistic, right? What, what, what does that bring up in you? I right. think is maybe where a lot of parents... Yeah. Um, don't don't go because that's a that takes a lot of, I mean, self work and and sort of reflection. And it also two rules that I've for give myself, and it applies to ev especially parenting, but um, it applies to marriage too very very much, and then friendship and everything else is like two things show up, <laughs> like I sort of feel like ninety percent of parenting should just showing up. Yeah, just show up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It's not about the grand gesture or the big thing. It's like just show up as much as you possibly can, and you won't be ever be able to show up enough. Mm -hmm. And love someone for who they are. Like that was the revelation to me in, in a long marriage, is, is like, or even in a long friendship. You know, there there are aspects of all of those people in a relationship that may, you know, we bump up against, 
But then I've come to a place in those relationships where I'm like, yeah, but I love that. Like, she drives me insane because she's like that. But that's also what's so great about yeah. her. Like, I met with Tony. Like, we're so different. And yet we love the craziness of each other. So we just like, accept, there's like acceptance. It's, it's mm -hmm. not a thing of like, why are you like that? What? You know, mm -hmm. and um, I think the same thing with our kids. You know, we'll find my, I find myself having anxiety as a parent. <laughs> yeah, but did you be? Why are you, you know? And then How I'm like, uh, how old are my kids? 29 and 34. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, you know, the, you know that, that impulse. And then I, I've, I like, I, I just have, I, I'm always telling myself, just take a breath. Uh -huh. And that's just be with what's actually happening, with who they, who they actually are, what they are actually going through. Even if it's an impulse to stop them, prevent them from suffering. It's true. And, and preventing them from suffering, that's not your job, right? Like, that's mm -hmm. not going to help them long term anyways, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I, know, I know. It's hard not I to. I know. <laughs> I'm uh, making a film about what it's like to be a parent to a disabled mm. child in 2024, right? What What is it? you know, what is the experience for a parent to raise a child in, in, in an ableist society, right? And one of the things that really struck me is like the lack of support for parents that's out there and the lack of stories like, you know, you've created for in, in Ezra of parenting, not trying to solve, you know, the disability or cure it, but actually embrace it and accept it. And in a way... <laughs> Do you feel like you've created the film that you may have needed? Yeah, <laughs> I did. And I felt, you know, I, that I showed it to people who had were experiencing the same thing. And mm -hmm. they were telling me, we need it, you know, and we kept getting acknowledgments, but to encourage us to keep working to try to get this made. And, and it was um, because we need it. That's a really, that's true. Yeah. I would also add, for for me personally, um, we all need it. it it's it's yeah. it, you know, autism in this film is a metaphor for uh, the pressure we put on our. It's the, your very first question: <laughs> When was the last time I thought I wasn't enough? When was the last time I thought my child was not enough? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was the last time I thought my wife or my husband was not enough? Or my, you know, my, 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 the people that I'm in relationship with, and it starts mostly with ourselves. We all have an impulse, a human impulse to sort of fit in. We're social creatures. So we want to fit into the norms of society. And um, we put tremendous pressure on ourselves and on our children mm -hmm. uh, to do that and children on themselves to yeah. be accepted and to fit in and be like everyone else. And, you know, what autism does is it makes that kind of impossible because mm -hmm. even though, as they say, every you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, Every the spectrum is so wide and everyone is so different, but aren't we all? And, oh, um, yeah. you know, like what Ezra in our story, Ezra just is cool being <laughs> Ezra. <laughs> Dimitri Spiridakis is always was fine being Dimitri. Yeah. And he's an amazing person and he's brilliant and he's super smart and creative he's an incredible artist and he was reading like an 11th grade level in first grade or something like that <laughs> you know not that that's some problem but that's just who he was yeah. not that everyone's like that but he it was when you try and force that person into a box yeah. that you get problems yeah so you have someone i mean honestly i was like that in school i, I was not on the uh, autism spectrum but i probably would have been diagnosed as adhd i'm guessing if it was a diagnosis when i was a kid I literally could not sit still in class. I could not, I was constantly just daydreaming. I couldn't, mm -hmm. my brain just didn't work that way. Yeah. And I was an unachiever. I mean, I remember my parents were really worried <laughs> about me sending me to all these like shrinks and stuff like that. I was fine. Mm -hmm. I, and so I, but when I discovered theater in high school right. and acting, I suddenly could concentrate for 12 hours straight without mm -hmm. stopping when I found something that made sense to me. Yeah. You know, I remember my father teasing me going, I've never seen you concentrate for longer than five <laughs> minutes on anything. And and so um, I, I just think it's true for everyone. And some people fit beautifully into certain patterns that are regulated, and that's fine. But all I'm saying is, um, uh, you know, Ezra, the story of Ezra isn't just about – autism is a metaphor, as I said, because yeah. this phenomenon of needing to fit in and realizing, no, it's the wrong question, yeah. right? Mm. The, yeah. Enough thing. It's, it's yeah. the wrong lens. Ezra, the autistic community has been responding well to it. Parents and families, Incredibly, I imagine right. everything has been really wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's been amazing. We, you know, From the very beginning, we, we knew we wanted to really involve the autism community in the making of the film. We knew we had to cast a neurodivergent 
child to play Ezra, which we found the most brilliant kid in William Fitzgerald. I think that the the, the community has, you know, so far, knock on wood, they've really embraced us. And and I was very always very concerned because there is such a wide range of experiences by parents and children who are so vastly different. And there are so many families that have so much more need than other families. Yeah. And I think what Tony said about the film that's really, I feel like even the, the parents of autistic children appreciate is that this is a film about parents, period. Regardless of whether your child is neurotypical or neurodivergent, mm. this really does tell a story about parenting. And, and, and that's the most beautiful thing that you could do. As somebody said in one of our podcasts that we were doing for an organization on autism, you nor they said to us, you guys, you nor Ezra normalizes this. Yeah. It, it's, it's nothing to be afraid of because yeah. every parent faces these, these, these challenges. Right. And that's what I think we got from the feedback from the autism community that I love. Beautiful. One of the things I loved about Ezra was it's a father son story on one hand. It's a story about, of course, Ezra and his journey, but it's really about how the father wants to show up for his son. Um, albeit he does some things that maybe are a little unorthodox, um, that maybe are not the best method or regardless, it was all in the spirit of loving his son. Also, what I loved about it was the relationship between um, the father and the mother, Roseburn, and also Bobby. That while they were divorced and Rose Byrne's character is married to you as the stepdad. Boyfriend. They're not, Boyfriend. They're not divorced oh, they're not yet. They're, okay. they're on the way to getting divorced. They're yeah, right. Because mm -hmm. Max won't sign the divorce papers. Yeah, Max papers. won't sign the divorce papers. That's right. So he that's won't right. sign yeah. it. For, yes. That's right. But you have a couple that's co-parenting. Mm -hmm. And while they had to find their footing, it also showed a relationship between people that are broken up but still caring about the child. They started to find their footing, but you honored it um, in showing a good relationship in a breakup. Um, and even the relationship with the new boyfriend, and while there had some footing there to find, it wasn't toxic. It still represented uh, two men being able to um, get along, be decent to one another, albeit there was some stuff. Um, I love that about this movie. It speaks mm. to the human spirit. It speaks to um, the child being the center of it, like wanting to show up as a father and a mother and letting that be the driving force. Well, versus... One of the things we we worked really hard on was to have no villains in this story. Yeah. In life, there's no villains. I mean, even what I was talking about, about wanting our kids to be enough, it's only wanting our children to be successful and thrive and be happy and not be hurt and not mm -hmm. be in pain. You don't, you know, you do not want to see your child struggling. We don't want to be in pain ourselves. Yeah. So we wanted to be represent make sure we were telling the story in a way that represents everyone's point of view. You know, Jenna, Rose Burns' character, she's not wrong. She's right about pretty much everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> Bobby's character, Bobby Cannavale's character, Max, is not wrong. He's right in so many ways, even though he he makes choices that are, just you know, that have destructive just, consequences. Yeah, yeah. Robert De Niro's character, Stan, the grandfather who, Bobby's, who Max is living with, you know, <clears throat> he's not wrong. He has his perspective, and everyone's just... Everyone's just Human. devoted to to, to to trying to help this kid and make this mm. child thrive. We're all just human. We're all sort of splashing around trying to. So with that, let me ask you this: What kind of father are you? I would say I'm I'm a very uh, um, engaged uh, father. I'm very loving. A, my my relationship with my two daughters is very um, maybe the most important. Uh, you know, they're the most important relationships in in my life and. Uh, I'm, I'm very attentive to them. Sometimes, sometimes my wife would call it codependent. <laughs> yeah. What is, so, uh, so I, maybe it's to a fault. I mean, what do you, I, maybe I, Tony could probably answer it better than me. I, cause I'm in it, you know, but, uh. How does that, you know, but how does it show up? What is, what, what do you think? What do you, what do you mean? How, the, like the, the, co codependency. the codependency. Oh, it just is, is, um, I'm perhaps too empathetic to my children. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I don't think there's such a thing. I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what is one of the ways? About your great father. 
Well, You're why don't, okay, why don't you talk father, about each other? About you you, you yeah. tell us what t- Tony a, a, as a father, and you tell us about him as a father. What what so why why are they why is he a great father? Tony, because they are the he loves his he loves his girls. I mean, one of his daughters is my goddaughter, you know, and 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 I I I just love watching how much how they've grown as young women. I mean, I remember going to watch. <laughs> Anna played basketball like she oh, was in the sixth grade or fifth grade and she was like a beast under the boards like she would just be like she was just the most incredible she was great and she was just big and I remember, and I remember watching Tony watching her and it was just this beautiful thing you always kept your cool and and I and I love that about I love that about how he is as a father he he communicates in a way that's not dogma you know what are some things that you've seen him learn and how he's doing better than maybe he would have earlier? Some things that he's gotten better at. Maybe something you would have said to him, hey, dude, I, this is a way to so, be a better father. Oh, my God. Whatever the You're asking me that. Yeah, yeah. About him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Don't go it's too the, dark. The <laughs> Don't, easy, easy, it's easy. It's easy the thought. appropriate part I had a problem with. <laughs> um, I have, there's a picture that came up yesterday on my phone, which was a memory from night. You know how Facebook does that? Here's a memory. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was from 1981, a photo that I had put into the library and it the popped up met. yesterday. And it was the year we met. Oh. <laughs> it's us in, dressed in Greek soldiers' uniforms. <laughs> we it's worked just, at a theater together. That's how we met. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't dress up. <laughs> was the Tony party. <laughs> but it was the funniest picture because just looking at Tony, and I'll, I'll show you the picture after we're done, but he was just like a puppy dog with like focus issues. Like he said, like he, he, he was even, but we, he was like, he was on acting. He was on it, you know, he was, and he was, that whole focus thing was about to end. You know, he had found his joy. He yeah. had found his passion. Yeah. And, but he was still to me, I just saw this puppy dog, you know, and I was like, who's this guy? It's like yeah. puppy dog. So to get to the, que- the answer to the question is, he keeps that, but he's matured. So he has gone. He has gone through, and I, and and here we've gone now. He's forty three years. That's crazy, right? All the different things, and it's not to get dark or light or anything. But you know, we go through things. We're human. We 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 have. Listen, I tell people, um, you know, I was the best man at his wedding, and he was the best man at all of my weddings. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that tells you <laughs> who the emotional roller coaster is here. All I'm saying about him is this guy was this puppy dog. And like, I was like, oh, you know, with a puppy, you worry. How are they going to get hurt? Are they going to, you know, maybe they'll run into the road or, you know. And so there was always a little like, come here, you. And you'd grab him by the ear. Uh, okay. You do that. And I was, that was kind of the relationship for a while. And then as we grew, I became the one <laughs> <laughs> needed to be grabbed well by the ear. <laughs> and so he um, went from puppy dog to like big dog and really great person and sensitive. And he never lost that genuineness or sensitivity, but he became more capable. And so as a father, you've been amazing. And as a friend, like, you know, I forgot his fucking birthday, okay? Like, <laughs> like, like I am the I worst. Know, I am like, really why I become that bad friend, you know? That's like, it's where really you go bad. like, Tony should just, he should move on from that Greek guy. <laughs> so, it's none of our so, remembering the birthdays. So, so, yeah, yeah, we have so. these phones that, where it pops up. <laughs> Tony's birthday. <laughs> and not, well, thank you, everyone, who sent me a text. But, you know. <laughs> anyway, that, 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 is, that is what I would say. Really that is what I would say. He, he All right, tell really, us something yeah. about him that he's... Uh, I'm going to be a wah, 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 To Perlis' <laughs> question, something yeah. great about him as a father. Yeah, well, we share the, um, the impulse to be, like, super engaged with our kids. Uh, Tony is with both of his boys, one of whom is my godson. Um, and... Uh, the the growth that I've seen in Tony is, um, as he described um, about how he dealt with Dimitri's autism, Tony was always a charger. <laughs> like there's a line in uh, Ezra <laughs> where De Niro says to Bobby Cannavale's character, he's like, you're Russian. What, you, what is it, Tony? You're, you're Russian, Russian blind. You get knocked on your ass. You, you're Russian blind. You get knocked on your ass. You give up all your power. So what do you got then? <laughs> and Tony used, and you used to have a term for it, like Tony was a charger. Right, he was, and so he would like get an idea about something, and it was often a brilliant idea. And he'd go, "This is what has happened," and he'd go charging into the situation and could not be 
dissuaded. Dissuaded. It was just like, which is one of the things that attracted me to him because I was the opposite. I, I was kind of like, like puppy dog. Be like, hey guys, what are, should, we, should we do this? Is that a good idea? Well, we don't have to do that. Okay, we don't know. You know, we can do it if you want. That was like my energy. Tony's like, no, we're doing this. And I'd be like, great, let's go. So, so as a parent, um, uh, you know, I watched Tony uh, as as he matured and sometimes having um it gone through some very, very painful experiences uh, and also being, I think, in the past 20 years in a relationship with an incredibly healthy woman. Tony's learned to uh, hold on to his power and uh, never deny his impulses. Like, still is very in touch with his impulses and his creative instincts and what he, what, you know, God is telling him to do without, a, uh, I guess it must be with less fear. Um, and you've learned to um, manage your anxiety so that you, you don't give anything up by not charging. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a result, you you know, your, your boys really lean on you mm -hmm. um, in a beautiful way, as do your stepdaughters, as does everyone in your family and your community. You've matured into that. The same thing of just getting older, you know, we, we get out of our own way. Mm -hmm. Love it. Get out of our own way. What's something that you've learned that he could uh, have done better or that he's learned how to do better? Tony uh, has always, oh, wow, man, has always had this gift for, for the spectacular, honestly. From the moment I met him is what attracted me to him. And everyone around him would see his just amazing charisma and, and talent that was burned very bright. And, but he used to think he needed to always be on fire. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> when you move through it. the world that way, things burn down. <laughs> so Tony's learned to gain control of his fire and is now so creative. Like he just makes so much shit. He's doing, he made this movie. He's created a whole art center in the town where he lives in, in Long Island. He, he's created a film school that now, you know, he, for a decade that all these, he's created this whole film network of young filmmakers in New York who are devoted to him. Um, his children are all thriving. He's in a thriving marriage. He's, you know, there's like, he's created this beautiful home. There's, a, he's very constantly creative. So you've learned to really harness that energy as opposed to um, letting the fire overtake you, which I think happened in the earlier years. Oh yeah. I appreciate you guys sharing. We have listeners, men that listen to us, of course, women as well, but men who are um, struggling their way through life like all of us. We have this pressure to compare ourselves to other men, how much money he's making, how he's parenting, the woman that he's got on his arm, whatever it may be. So I feel like parenthood, fatherhood is one of the things that we're always struggling to get right. We do a lot good. I'm a father of four. Been married three times. How many of you been times? You remember you said all your marriages? Fourth one. Oh, fourth one. Okay, yeah. Three times. This is it for me now. Uh -huh. What I'll say is that I've learned a lot along the way as a father. I, my first child I was so good to. Um, we were dear friends. If I, you were to ask her anything, we had her on the podcast one time. We called her like, what did I do that I could have done better? She could not find something to say. She finally found one. Like, I wish she would have been followed through more with promises. And then I had a son 13 years later, and now I got a seven and uh, eight-year-old um, in my third marriage. And they're all tight. They all live at home, except my daughter now has got a baby. And my son, who's 21, we just started talking again after seven because he didn't feel like I thought he was enough. He's like my hero. I mean, I'd love him to death, adore him. How old is he? 21. We got into a fight because um, there was some behavior that could have been a little bit better on his end. Just normal behavior that we do at 21 years old. Nothing terrible. Maybe a little course correction needed to be in there, but he's 21, he's his own man. Mm -hmm. But I held on a little too tight and overreacted. And it caused a big fight, and um, he wouldn't see or talk to me for seven months. He moved out. And um, so I've had, like, some reflecting to do. Like, just as a man, like, how can, I, how can I care about humanity, care about men, boys? How do we be better for women? How do I demonstrate how to treat humans? And my very son, and I do a show called Man Enough, and my son didn't feel enough by me, like— because I was controlling, not letting him be who he is, which is what I love about the story, what you had said earlier about Ezra. It's like you have to learn how to accept 
and that someone is enough. Like you're not going to fix them, as you had said. This is you accept who they are. And while my son's not special needs at all, he's uh, I didn't accept him for being beautifully, wonderfully himself. And this was someone that I would have said seven months ago, I'm dad of the year. And yet the dad of the year didn't wasn't spoken to by his son for seven months. Some reflection. How many other men, fathers, specifically speaking about them, um, might share a story like that? Like, how do we be better? Well, I think everybody, but I, I would, I hear my wife's voice. One of the areas of criticism that I come under sometimes is my dread of not wanting my daughters to feel that way. And, and Jane's like, it's okay that they think you're an asshole sometimes. <laughs> like that's, you're the, you're the parent, like they don't need to like you all the time or approve of you all the time. And they have good, like she gets into these, like she doesn't mind that my daughter's mom is such a bitch, ah, 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 you know, she's right. totally cool with that. For me, it causes me <laughs> physical pain mm, yeah. when my daughters are like, you know, so, and, and I actually view that as, um, it has its good side, but also I view it as a frailty of my own. So I'm, I'm, I have no idea what the situation was with your son, but sometimes I know that's like a, a button for me yeah. to not like if it, and it yet, was one for me too. I yet did. I did the same thing to my father for about a year. Uh, I didn't talk to him when I was in my twenties and, um, I felt that he behaved disrespect. And he did. He was he treated me with some disrespect. But years later, when I just recently, I was reflecting back on that time, and I was like, maybe that was me. <laughs> like maybe maybe I projected all that stuff onto him, and he was just trying to help me out. You know, trying to like, manage me. Some little thing that he said set me off so bad on a phone call that he would never have even remembered that the words came out of his mouth. Mm. And I did not speak, to, it was on such a sensitive issue, I did not speak to him for yeah. a year. And I used to bitch to Tony about him all the time, you know, like in my 20s, it was just really, you know, hard. I had to ultimately, uh, uh, you know, a therapist helped me hmm. out with it, it that actually it's someone Tony recommended who saved my life in a lot of ways. But all I'm saying, it suddenly occurred to me, I was like, oh, maybe I just needed to go through that. And he yeah. was the, um, had to be the receptacle of my... <laughs> <laughs> of, my, of my rage or whatever it was you know I, so uh, and i'm not saying he behaved perfectly because he, he didn't but i don't know it's just an interesting yeah. thing i find that so hard to tolerate as a father and i do view it as a, a frailty of mine as a parent yeah so i i, I hear you and i'm sorry you had to experience well, that thank you painful. for sharing that we're good now and i talked to him and he um we held each other for probably 20 minutes without standing down like just mm. when he finally said hi daddy i'm ready to see you and it broke me down and mm -hmm. I just held him and, you know, forgave me and I forgave him. I, I didn't need to forgive him. I think the key is that we are constantly um, course correcting our kids, course correcting, course correcting from their young, course correct. And then you blink and then they're an adult. And then I realize I'm not supposed to course correct them anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, um, whatever. So how does that manifest in like the world? We course correct. How much do we course correct women? Mm -hmm. You know, our wives are just... Um, to a fault, not like to to be helpful, but um, well, to those, be in control. As long as it's coming from a loving place, and you know that's doesn't mean you won't make a mess of things as the father. But if you're coming from a loving place, you know time will sort of even things out the way it did with Tony and his dad. Right? It's like he looks at it twenty years later and is like, hmm, maybe mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I, I did something there, right? And the, and his father, because I know the whole. I was there for all of it. He was doing it because he loved his son, mm -hmm. but he was doing it wrong. And that's okay. Like, we can't always do everything we do. Mm -hmm. Men, women, it, you don't do it. Is, we're not perfect. Yeah. We're imperfect. But if we're doing it for love, then that's, you know, we're trying to help and we could be completely wrong. We have a chance that time will heal that. I mean, my thing for me is... You know, in terms of how you deal with women and how you deal with men, you know, I I, I have gone through many, many uh, periods of my life where I dealt with both badly. And in, for the same reason, one, I felt like I wasn't as good a listener as my best friend who I watch and try to learn from. You know, I, I you know, 
they say, pick somebody who's better than you and, and hang around them and try to learn from them. But there was an attraction for both of us. Like I had things that he didn't have, but he had this other part of him that was, I was like, God, I just have to control my impulse to just barge in here and either fix it or change it or make it happen. You know, and the, it takes time. And and I didn't do that because I was a, I didn't ever get up in the morning and think, how am I going to fuck up my kids? Right. Or <laughs> let me see, how can I end this marriage now? <laughs> I'm just going to blow this up. Because, mm. That's not, you know, no, I, I thought it was a good idea, whatever I was mm. railing against, but it, you know, at the end of the end of the day, when you put your head down on the pillow, now that I'm older, I just look back and the thing I can let myself go for, it's almost like I hear Tony's wife's voice <laughs> too, because she's like, hey, you did what we, you thought was right in that moment and it was not right. And that's okay because you're not going to do everything perfectly. You're mm -hmm. not going to get it right. And yeah. But the, the most important thing is to learn how to listen. But also to me, the p second part for me is how to talk to people. Like when I was not good parent, it was when I was letting my emotions get the better of me. Mm -hmm. And that was important to bring that in and 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 let things land and yeah. not react to every single thing mm -hmm. and uh you know i'm still I'm st it's still a work in progress yeah so mm -hmm. that's for sure but what you went through you reacted i guess in that situation with your son you were just reactive because you needed to correct something that you saw would be helpful <laughs> you weren't doing it to mess him up more no, no. right yeah. but when you're 21 and you hear that you feel disrespected and that was a lot of what Tony went through, you know. And with my sons, it's the same thing. I just had to start to be more careful. But so, too, with how I deal with women, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Because, and it's people. It's really like, to me, it's like how you deal with people. Mm -hmm. You know, we've well lost said. this ability to listen and not just think we need to sum it up, blow it out the door and, you know, it cause these explosions with each other. Well said. It's interesting, you know, I'm watching the world turn into things that I thought like I did wrong and now I'm seeing so many people do them wrong and, and I don't know what's going to make it accountable, but I hope that people learn how to listen and I hope that they learn how, yeah. you know, not to go and explode and just mm -hmm. say anything they think yeah. of saying. And, and, if we're lucky, our parents, um, like there is a gap between us and our parents, right? Um, there's supposed to be things that you teach your kids to do or know about themselves that, 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 that you didn't have when you were a kid, right? Like I, you know, it's different. I think, I think father, son and mother, daughter relationships are very different, but there is this sort of common denominator of like, you expect a lot from them, you know, and we demand a lot from them. And if we're disappointed, there is, because I also, um, you know, went through a period of being so angry at my mom that I kind of, yeah, refused to to speak to her. And now that I, th I, th I think about it, I'm like, man, I lost a month. You know, for me, it was a month. Maybe women, it's a little shorter than men. But, um, <laughs> and yeah, she just didn't have the tools that I have. And you know why I have the tools? Because she gave them to me, you know, or she created an environment where I was able to have yeah, them. Yeah. And so I think there is this, yeah part of sort of becoming an, an adult or becoming your own person where you, yeah, you realize things that you needed that maybe you didn't get or things that you're, you know, not getting right now. And so there's this separation from the parent, right? But I think ultimately it's, it's being, you know, having compassion for, for them and knowing that, yeah, they, they, they didn't wake up every morning and be like, how am I going to fuck you up? <laughs> right. They really woke up every morning trying to do their best with what they, you know, had. Um, <laughs> So I mean, and I just I'm so fascinated by your friendship. I think it's so special, and I'm sure listeners, I, I'm getting to experience it in person, and it's really electric. Um, and I know people who are just listening can feel it too. There are a lot of um, our male listeners who ask us very often uh, a, one sort of question that comes up a lot, which is how do I build friendships with other men? You know, a lot of men are now, um, you know, far more isolated, far more lonely. Um, they have less friendships than they used to. You two have been friends for decades. Uh, how many 40 years? Plus 40, 40, 40 plus years. years. years yeah. You've been through, I mean, you, you're, both of your lives are very different. You've been through a lot and you've maintained this like incredible bond. So what would be your advice to men who are listening about how to main, you know, I'm sure it's been tested and mm -hmm. maybe you want to talk about that or, uh, yeah. you know, some, some, uh, something that you've learned. 
You have to be willing to share. I mean, if you're going to have this kind of friendship, I just think men or women, it, it's 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 finding a person who you feel safe with. And if you find that person that you feel safe with, call them friend. And then if you really want to get close, <clears throat> share your core pain. Mm, that's right. Yeah. And so I know that's like a buzzword, right? I just said that buzzword, but it's really true. You find somebody that's safe, they're your friend, you interact, you go to the ball game together, you like being around them. And then if you really want to get close and you want to go deeper, and then you start sharing that core pain. And to me, I dumped that on Tony early on and vice I think versa. the first five minutes we met. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's I, what women you know, do, by the way. Like yeah. it's, it's sort of a stereotype, well, but it's, I yeah, think, well, it's, so that would have, that would be the yeah. advice for men, right? <laughs> do what women do hey. and, 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 and turn yourself inside out to another person and see what that's like, because to keep things inside and say that's manly is bullshit. So my advice to, to men is if you find somebody you trust and you're safe, then you can, you know, unload. And there's different ways to do it. I mean, yeah. like a lot of, like we're actors, so we're, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we have like a neurotic obsession with self-revelation. But um, <laughs> so but, well said. But most guys, you know, that uh, you know, certain friends of mine are not so comfortable with that. So like, right. like one friend of mine is like, guys need to do stuff together. Like they don't. Uh -huh. Guys can't like just talk to talk. The way you know his more yeah. old fashioned kind of he's like so we got to do something together and he had had a, a very close friendship with someone and they'd not seen each other for a while and like we're trying to find a way to reconnect he's like we couldn't like talk about it, but we had to find a project that we could do together you know and so we did pick this thing and they did this this long term project together and um and I, I thought that was so great because I was like oh I don't I don't I don't struggle with that particular thing but I, I'm sure that a lot of guys do so whether it's going to the ball game but then investing in that friendship because i think what the the yeah. hazard of not of doing is you're like if you don't share your core pain or it's hard for you to like start to go there it's easy to disconnect and then be like yeah see you later you know and then not and you leave unsatisfied you leave with a hole in your heart a little bit and you know in, in a, a love relationship a romantic relationship you know you you might want to share and then you don't you don't take that step to kind of open yourself and he or she walks away and you're like, oh God, I, I, I didn't do it. And I think it's the same thing in man to man friendships to have a little bit of courage, but just hang. Mm. <laughs> just in the hang, <laughs> shit comes out. You right. know what I mean? And then you're like, oh wow. That's right. Yeah, we talked about some stuff, didn't we? You know, that, <laughs> so don't let your fear shut that down because it can be lonely. And especially with in our moment of, of social, of, of virtual community. Uh, it freaks me out what what's happened with social media, which is undeniably a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. But I see a generation younger than mine um, having virtual relationships and virtual community. And then you hear, <clears throat> you know, that what's going on with mental illness and with young people and people not having community and, you know, men and women and men and men and women and women meeting each other on dating apps, which is super useful. And both my daughters met their partners on dating apps. But... You know, I don't know. There's something also about this lack of connection. So it's 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 hazardous. So I think people, men and women, need to be that much more attentive uh, to not squander those uh, mm. moments of connection. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm. So you're both married. You've been married how long? Thirty-seven years, and I met my wife the same day I met Tony. No he way. He introduced us. Yeah. That's so. Wow. Sweet. Yeah, she was my girl. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> for a couple of days. For a couple of days. No, 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 she wasn't. Let me, let's just she say, wasn't his girl. She, in he my, was hoping in she my would mind. Be. In oh, my mind. I see. Oh, you liked her. I thought she was very Tony beautiful. Met, Tony, we met at this theater festival <laughs> where we were working. As we, we like became instant friends. <clears throat> and we're hanging out. And he said, oh, this girl. You got to meet her. She's so, she's so amazing. You got to meet this girl. I was like, okay. And she's a designer. Jane's a, a production designer. And uh, she was a theater set designer at that time. And um, so I was like, okay. And then Tony like had me meet her. And then uh, Jane was, was an athlete. Like she was like a national champion rower. So she was very disciplined. She would get up every morning at like six o'clock and go for a run, right? So that was just her routine. And, uh, and Tony's I like, said, sure, I'll go with yeah, you, Yeah, so Jane. Tony goes, we went running yesterday. He said, no, Tony goes to me, <laughs> do you have an extra pair of running shoes? I said, what? He said, well, Jane, this girl, I'm going to introduce you to her. She likes to run. And we went running this morning, and I didn't have any shoes, so I ran barefoot. 
I was like, how far did you run? He said, like three I, miles. I freaking he said, did. He said, I told her that's how we do it Mountain in Queens. Mountain trails. I said, we do that and in Queens. And he said, my feet are bleeding. Can I, can I borrow a pair of shoes? I was like, yeah, I think I have an extra pair. And you can have mine. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it turned out I had two pairs of gym shoes with me. And so I gave him one. And, and so then he said, well, you got, why don't you come with us? Big tomorrow. mistake. And that I was, was like, my mistake. At 21 years old, I was like running at seven o'clock in the morning. That's insane. I'm not oh doing that. God. But I did. And we went for a run. And then, um, and like, forget it. I forget mean, it. I, they were just like loping and lo like, they, this is like me in the back, like with a you know <laughs> pair of sneakers that don't fit. Yeah. And that's really not the only reason, but they were just like both like gorgeous, like this. <laughs> Mount Olympus kind of thing going Jane on. Jane takes us and up they were to like this, loping up the hill. She and takes us up to this pond <laughs> in the Berkshires in Massachusetts, where this was, and um, and uh, she takes us, finds this little beautiful pond, uh, and we get to the top of this hill. And there's this pond, and Jane strips off her clothes. And I'm huffing behind, like yeah, he the shows her like, you know, like some thirty seconds behind or whatever. Jane like gets this pond, she goes, see this place, and she takes all of her clothes and dives in the water. So Tony's like comes running up, like, <gasps> and I'm like. Did you just so I take my clothes off and I dive in the water and Tony's like, there are living things in there. I am not going near that water. I'm not going in there. <laughs> so he like waited for us. Outside as Jane and I swam together. And that was pretty much the end of that. Was the end of that in the <laughs> but it became of like else. we became like inseparable, like the Aww. three of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah really we were so. inseparable. And then wow. yeah. Isn't that funny? Well, tell us something then that you have done in your marriage that's made it successful. Something that you have done. Well, I, again, I, I'm repeating myself. The thing that I've really has made it successful is learning to love my wife for who she is. Successful. That's a great answer. Do you do something now in the last 10 years that you didn't do in the first 10 years that you've learned? Like yeah, Dumb stuff, man. It's like showing up. I, I, I make coffee for her every single morning. Hmm. I mean, unless I usually get up before her, but like just the dumb gesture of like, it's like a stupid ritual mm -hmm. that I'd make her coffee. And then if she comes down, I make it the way she likes it. And I, ha I hand it to her like a joke. You know, I'm like, here's your coffee, man. You know, like a beautiful. Like, and, um, and it's just like, a, d d d I'm sure we have others, but like silly rituals that are just an expression of, of a, it's a kind of love language mm -hmm. that isn't, it's just simple, but it's kind of showing up. Um, and she does that. For me, in, in more ways than I, I love can that. count. My uncle and aunt have been married 50 years or something of that nature. And other than a couple times when he's been out of town or anything, he's brought her a cup of coffee every morning for 50 years. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just beautiful. It's beautiful. Stunning. I love it. Yeah. Um, how about you? How long have you been married? Well, I'm not married, but I've been with my partner for 17 years. Okay, 17 wow. years. So your relationship, and then there were three others beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are you doing differently in this one that allows it to last 17 years versus I th maybe I th you were in the I think it's mainly her. <laughs> 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 yeah, but what, what did you learn? Tony, you know, I want you She's to tell us what did you learn woman. that, uh, um, of course, it's her. It's her. But you no, must on. also you do a lot. Uh, have learned something. Garbage. That, I'm the I'm the waste management guy. I love, I, I, <laughs> I make I, I love sure it. that the place is clean. It's the weirdest thing, but I you would not think that. But I am. I'm like I try to do that. But he, but I but I learned that she loves flowers, mm -hmm. and like she just loves that moment that you adore her you know like we got into a big fight and it was me who said that i was like i just want you to adore me and she just burst out laughing and ended the fight which is like that's not your line that's my <laughs> line like you shouldn't be saying that and it's sort of true and 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 i think there's a you know the thing uh, that is that i learned is that i no matter how tough we go at each other at certain times when we laugh, it's like mm. it's like the best thing. So I always try to make her laugh and find that the place where we really connect. So and we have six kids between us, and and I whenever we get in a car and drive someplace, it's like we are back to when we first met. Mm. It's the greatest thing. It's like you could have every life comes at you, and you have six kids, and then we get in a car and we take a road trip and we're like dancing. <laughs> In the street, because it just brings back, it brings us to that joyous place. So I have to remember, and she has been really instrumental in teaching me that I have to take a break from all that getting up in the morning and seeing how you're going to change the world stuff and take time for yourself. She's really good at that. Mm. And I'm really not good at that. So the thing I try to do is go with her energy to getting 
us away from everything so we can connect. Thank you. All right, we're going to wrap up. What does it mean to you to be man enough? What it means to me to be man enough is to be uh, brave enough to trust that I'm enough. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) You see the puppy dog? Did you see that? All right, Tony. How about (laughs) quick Any sentences? Uh, Give us a sound bite. Quick. Good trouble. Um, To be man enough is not to be afraid to get into good trouble. That's what I think about man enough. And I know that's a very manly thing to say, but I don't care. It's true. I feel like everybody (laughs) should know that, you know, and I think women need to do that too. I think everybody needs to be that, whatever that is that I just answered for manly enough (laughs) is get into good trouble. Stop being afraid of, you know, speaking up against things that you see that are wrong. And, and, and I, that's it. That was more than three sentences. No, but it was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, <whatever. laughs> All right, boys. Uh, thanks so thank much you. for joining us. Thank, um, thank you. It's been great having you here. Um, Liz, what do you, you have anything to say to wrap up? Wrap, I mean, wrap so up? many things. Yeah, we talk a lot about male friendship on the show and, and in theoreticals, but we got to see it up close. You can go through stuff. Mm. You mean real stuff. And um, that having, yeah, a close friendship can help you do that and... I think it's such a an incredible film in terms of autistic representation. And, such a good um, film. And speaking of the film, let's yeah. just share a little bit about it because um, it's um, come out May 31st. Um, so those of you listening, go see it. It's called Ezra, <clears throat> starring Bobby Cannavale. It's got um, Rose Byrne. It's got Rain Wilson, Whoopi Goldberg, Robert De Niro. <laughs> um, Tony um, directed it and the other Tony yeah. wrote it. And uh, Wayfair was able to be one of the studios behind it as well as Closer Media. Um Bleecker Street is distributing it. Um, it's really, really exciting, yeah. and it's a good movie, and it speaks to um, important issues, and it's just about family and yeah. sacrifice. It's also a good movie. Like, you know, I love when movie. disability movies are good. Good. Right? All right, everyone. If you've enjoyed listening to us today, and then join us. Where do they find us? Uh, manenough.com slash podcast. You can find everything. We're on Spotify, Apple podcasts. We're on YouTube if you want to watch us and watch this amazing friendship in person. Um, Highly recommend. There's so many ways to find us. Um, We're everywhere. All right, everyone. We'll see you next time. In the meantime, I'm Jamie Heath. I'm Liz Plank. And this is Man Man Enough. Enough.